Hello and welcome to Breaking the Cycle. My name is Alan Hyde and I'll be your guide into the world of mental health, recovery, and spirituality. Tonight I am joined by our producer Gabe. How are you doing, Gabe? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Good, it's good to good. see you. We've been in a bit of a, a rhythm here lately, haven't we? Yeah, man, we have. <laughs> yeah. We're coming a nice little combination, you know what I'm saying? That's right. And uh, <laughs> Gabe and I were talking a little bit uh, off the the stream here, we're going to talk a little bit about expectations and relationships and kind of just have a free flow and conversation and see what kind of uh, nonsense we can get into here. Let's do it. What, what direction you think when, uh, when you think of expectations, where does your mind go first? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just the standards that we set for ourselves in relationships, things that we're not going to tolerate, things that we will tolerate. Um, because you, you said in the context of relationships or just in general? Yeah, I mean, if that's if that's where your mind goes first, because um, we'll, we'll probably go in a few different directions. And, yeah, because yeah. with expectations, I see it a lot of different ways. It's just things that you that you have that, honestly, <laughs> how can I explain it? It's really just things that you kind of prepare for, mm. in a way, in a sense. Um, something that I'm trying to find the words without saying expect <laughs> <laughs> it's hard isn't it it's difficult it's really hard but um yeah just something that you can kind of prepare for in a sense that you know like okay yeah i anticipate that this is going to happen here and if mm. it doesn't happen that way it causes a lot of disappointment mm. um it's kind of like again going back to the relationships piece like it's the standards that we set for ourselves the things that we expect the needs that we have in a relationship Mm. Um, I think it's it's kind of multifaceted in a way. Yeah. What if uh, What if I told you that in the context of a relationship, every expectation you set is going to be unmet? Mm hmm. You, would you? I one thousand percent agree. Yeah, <laughs> thousand percent. Now, what if I told you that not only are they going to be unmet, but if they do go unmet, which mm -hmm. expectations will, you might become resentful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And that's, as you guys are listening along, when, uh, when an individual comes into, right, see me in therapy or, you know, when I'm talking with other therapists or in recovery circles, mm -hmm. this is a, a very common held understanding in relationships that a lot of reasons that relationships find themselves in tension is because they have not just high expectations, but they're placing such expectation on the way that somebody should behave day in and day out. Right. Exactly. And man, you know, people get at each other's throats when there's things that they feel aren't being met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's the dangerous part about going into relationships with expectations. I feel like so many people kind of, again, going back to standards, like people have these things that they've set as standards, but they're really just expectations. Yeah. <laughs> they're not really yeah. standards because there's a certain, it depends on the situation and how y'all interact or whatever that's, whatever that may be. Yeah. Um, they're really just standards that you put in place and it's like, oh, if it's not met, then that's below my expectations. So, right. Yeah, you know, and I know we've talked about this in, in other conversations of, mm -hmm. you know, there's such expectation to like when you go on your phone and look at social media, there's yeah. all kinds of expectations that we're running into, not just in relationships, but the way yeah. your body should look and the, the way you should eat. And then mm -hmm. you scroll down Instagram and it's like you're going to get 10 different messages on 10 different ways to do any of those things. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's, and again, like we talked about it last week, I think like it's we're in the space of overconsumption, mm. and with that overconsumption comes a lot of comparison. Yeah, um, and a lot of those expectations that we have from ourselves really have to do with how other people look on the internet. Yeah, it's not so much about our true desires or what we really want. The expectations that we've created are things that are really not gonna last long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to be honest, they're very surface level yeah. um and really i mean in the long term don't necessarily add the value that they, that we think it does yeah you know and that's that's something too it's really important about expectations because you you said something in the beginning um about our needs in mm -hmm. relationships and this is kind of what sparked this topic this week as i was mm -hmm. talking with someone earlier in the week about needs in a relationship yeah. and 
what he noticed he needed at the end of the relationship was uh, in the way of being the way he was being treated mm-hmm. in the relationship and really what it boiled down to you know wasn't just the surface conversation of like jealousy yeah. in relationships but when they would go out to dinner him mm-hmm. and a significant other it, he couldn't even look at the waitress yeah, you know and he had crazy. to yeah he, he had <laughs> to have a serious conversation with himself about if she never changes that behavior ever Mm -hmm. am I still going to choose this person? Mm -hmm. And he had been asking himself that question over the course of a couple months because he'd been dating this girl for a year, and the answer was no. Mm -hmm. And so then the boundary had to come in of, you know, if my answer is no, that I wouldn't choose this person if she doesn't Mm -hmm. change that behavior, I need to get out of the relationship. And I think a lot of times I talk with people about that. That can sound pretty harsh, Mm -hmm. but imagine that behavior never changes, and here you are 25 years later. and miserable. Yeah. Yeah, and it comes to a head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what do you think uh, are needs in a relationship? Um, for me personally, or sure. yeah, I mean, for me, I need to be able to. F- I need comfortability, mm. um, and comfortability in the sense of just being able to be myself around you, crack jokes with you. Like I need to, I need that banter. Mm. <laughs> like that's a big thing for me. Like I play a lot. Yeah. Um, with the people that I'm connected to. So that's a big thing for me, a sense of humor. Um, on top of the fact of just like kind of creating a peaceful environment. I don't do well with drama. Mm. Um, I don't do well with loud arguments. <laughs> yeah. I don't do back and forths. Um, to me, I just don't see the value in that when we could just discuss whatever the issue is. Um, yeah. So communication in that way, just mm constant respect on um, both sides both parties involved like i it has to be mutual respect yeah um i think those are the biggest things for me personally yeah. so humor peace like peace of mind peace mm-hmm. and serenity communication mm-hmm. right and respect they're pretty big ones do you if you were to re- reflect on this for a moment what do mm-hmm. you think the the word that you said the most when you were answering me was uh it's one letter is one letter. Uh-huh. Um, I. I. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so in a relationship, when it comes to needs, mm-hmm. what's the most important thing for us to remember? It's us. It's us, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Our individual needs, mm-hmm. right? And, and you were right on that track, mm-hmm. right, from the jump with answering that. And this is where, you know, Gabe and I were joking a little bit before about uh, those Netflix shows with <laughs> Nick Lachey and his wife. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and how outrageous some of them are extremely entertaining, but how outrageous some of them are. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing from the jump in those types of shows or that type of entertainment is you see – a front row seat to when a relationship makes it all about somebody else having to change. Mm -hmm. All right. Exactly. I think it's very, they give a surface level visual of what relationships are to me. Mm. And I think that's kind of where we're at in society anyway. So it, it works and it makes sense, but people don't really understand that. Like regardless of like, you're not going to like that person every single day. You're not going to want to deal with that person every single day. It's a choice. So it's hard for people to really wrap their mind around choosing one person every single day mm-hmm. because so many things are just deal breakers. Like right. <laughs> it's so many like small little ancillary things that are deal breakers for people these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not really willing to work through anything. It's just like, oh, you, I need you to come as a finished package mm-hmm. ready to go. Yeah. And that's so. that it's a, it's a good point to highlight, Gabe, because mm-hmm. <sighs> If, if the needs are ours, mm-hmm. right, I'm already setting myself up for failure in a relationship if in the beginning I go into it and, and I'm going to nitpick what you've got going on. Yeah, exactly. You know, because we have no control over yeah. that person meeting those needs, do we? Mm-hmm. Not at all. Not yeah. at all. I mean, the problem is everybody's looking to get into relationships to be happy. Mm. Happiness is not a guarantee. Right. <laughs> Happiness is a choice that you make with yourself. It has nothing to do with somebody else. Yeah. And so, and I don't know what everybody listening believes, but I know what I believe, and God never promised us happiness 24-7. Yeah. 
actually quite the opposite. Exactly. Right? It's like uh, a line <laughs> from one of my favorite books. The first line of the book says, life is suffering. Yeah. Period. Exactly. Right? There's no justifications to that. There's no, no one's getting out of that one. Yeah. You know, and, and if people think that's not going to happen in relationships, mm -hmm. well, they're going to find out. Yeah. You know? And that's, I think that's the biggest part of why the divorce rate is so high. Yeah. Because people got into it for the wrong reasons. Like, you got into a marriage and a relationship to check a box. Mm. It wasn't really, because love to me, when you talk about love, it's a choice mm. every single day. Like I choose to show up for you. I choose to show up in a way where you know that I love you. Yeah. It's, it's action. Mm. And a lot of people don't want to put that action in that work in. Yeah, it's, you know, it's because in order to show up for somebody else, mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, you know, if I'm going to show up for my significant other, but I haven't been showing up for me, mm -hmm. all right? It's not a switch that you can just flip on. Yeah. And you see that, like, you know, I've seen that a lot in my career where, you know, the hope is that, uh, like you said, they mm -hmm. they want the happiness, they want the dopamine, mm -hmm. right? But it's always what the other person is doing wrong. Yeah. But anytime we can identify what another person is doing wrong, mm -hmm. it's because we're fixated and focused on them without looking at ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, I always put it to my clients the way my therapist put it to me is that we attract the level of health in which we embody, right? Absolutely. So the healthier we are, the healthier partner we attract. Absolutely. Have you found that to be true in your years of dating? 1,000%. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in every stage of me dating, I could say that the person that I attracted was the person, was a reflection of me at that time. Yeah. Um, and it's very interesting some of the experiences that I've had with that, um, just because it was such a, like the reason why I say I don't do drama now is because I did do drama back uh -huh. then. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I had those back and forths. I had those loud screaming matches. Like I'm not doing that no more because I've experienced it and I know it wasn't healthy for me. Mm. Um, and so, again, I think a lot of the, going back to expectations, a lot of those expectations are things that we create because of what we've been through. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times it's not fair to the new person because you're bringing all of that stuff to that new situation. Yeah. that's It's a big uh, turning point I realized for myself in my mm -hmm. recovery was that um, all of my expectations were, were rooted in my resentments out mm -hmm. of unresolved issues. And, and like, you know, like you were saying too, it's like uh, I didn't have those resentments out of nowhere. I had yeah. those resentments because I had been in those situations, mm -hmm. you know, and especially in relationships, it was a revolving door of finding myself with the type of women mm -hmm. that were going to reconfirm every resentment I had before <laughs> so that I could try to master it and do yeah. it better only to find that I got kicked in the teeth again. Yeah. And some of them would create new ones Yeah, that you didn't know was there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, it's like, <laughs> like just even I'm thinking back, Oh my gosh, I've had so many experiences with just being in a situation that felt so perfect yeah. and then getting into it a few months into it. And I'm like, Oh, I can't stand this person. Mm. Yeah. Like, oh, this is a totally different person than the person I was introduced to. Yeah. So um, I think that's a realization for a lot of people. Yeah. You um, know, it's um, I talk with a lot of 12 steppers. Obviously, I don't I don't typically out my anonymity here, but I'm a 12 stepper myself. And, uh, you know, what, what we find in, in the 12 step recovery process is, is when we get to the fourth step is the ego, mm -hmm. right? The pride, the self-centeredness, the selfishness, the, um, you know, resentment, the fear, all of those aspects, right? That, you know, kind of they lump themselves in. And, and I, I've always liked the way my therapist put it is like we, we have our cameras on tripods here. Yeah. It's like a, a, a intense relationship is built on the tripod of intensity, drama, and chaos. Mm -hmm. And when we don't realize by looking at ourselves in that reflection, mm -hmm. you know, because not everybody has to be in a, like a, an addictive process. Not everybody has to be coming from an alcoholic home to have that base human desire for like drama right. you know and some are better at reeling it in than mm -hmm. others like there there are millions of people out there that were way fucking better than me they're yeah. reeling those things in i can say yeah. that um 
but when you were saying like, uh, oh man, this is the one, mm-hmm. right? That intensity, mm-hmm. you know, I, I catch that in with my clients all the time of like, oh, you know, we moved in within a month. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, that's intense, yeah. you know? Another one too that, I, you know, I was definitely victim of for a really long time was like, man, I, I'll, I'll sleep with a girl on the first night I met her, you know? Oh, yeah, same. And, and it would just destroy any chance of long-term getting to know her, mm-hmm. you know? I just didn't know that at the time. Yeah, and I, Again, like I was the same way. Like it was so easy <laughs> not to like talk about talk yeah. myself up, but you know what I'm saying? Like it was just very easy to do. Yeah. Um and you kind of killed the opportunity to really like really indulge and get to know a person before yeah. you cross that line cuz once you cross that line there is no coming back from it. Yeah. And there's a lot that comes with having any type of sexual intercourse or relations yep. early in a relationship. Like it's, yeah. it can be a detriment to y'all's growth. Yeah. You know, and I, I had never thought about it. And my, my therapist is a, she's a 35 year, you know, she's getting ready to retire. Mm-hmm. Uh, but hearing from the female perspective, I started mm-hmm. working with her probably about five years ago. Mm-hmm. And when she laid it out for me of like, um, you know, when, when you get into bed with a woman, Mm -hmm. things change for her in a way that doesn't change for guys. Right. It kind of happens to us a little bit later of like, Oh shit, I'm actually into this girl. But one of the things I never fathomed and never talked about or thought about was when you enter into like the, you know, the sexual side of things with Mm -hmm. a female, she wants, she's going to start to legitimize that Mm -hmm. sexual act. She wants to legitimize that. So then the conversations of commitment in her own mind start Mm -hmm. before you even know, or, you know, depending on how stable she is, Mm -hmm. they could start coming right away, you know, of like, Hey, where's the commitment? Uh, You know, you ain't, you ain't shit. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on here. Yeah. It unlocks a lot of, because I know so many women who have been through a lot of trauma in that. Mm -hmm regard because it it comes from a place of I want to feel loved Mm. Um, I know so many women who didn't grow up with a father in home or a mother in home and so like they act out of what they missed Mm -hmm. Um, and so in those situations I I mean being totally honest I didn't handle all of those with care yeah I just didn't like I didn't have the bandwidth or the understanding to even handle those situations properly yeah. um so i would just because i was in it for my own self-interest <laughs> mm-hmm. i was in it for what i could get out of it and most for most men it's sex yeah so um i think a lot of men kind of discount the value of that to a woman right um because for us it's simple <laughs> mm-hmm. for them it's not as simple it's a little bit more complex yeah, you know, and I completely relate on that. And I always kind of put this tidbit out there too, like for those who are listening, if mm-hmm. if someone from my past were to stumble upon um, hearing me talk about these topics, I, I would, uh, you know, just there are a lot of people in my life I've made amends to, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but for those you know who have been in my life, um, you're valuable. You're a wonderful mm-hmm. person. Um, you know, never meant to hurt you. Yeah. Right. But. Uh, you know, those were my shortcomings and Mm -hmm. things I needed to work through. And so there's, there's a certain point where like, I'm not going to apologize only from the standpoint of like, it'd be better if I took accountability, Mm -hmm. you know? And part of that, like we've been talking about and touching on and for men listening to part of that accountability is we stop hurting people, you know? And it's interesting in that realm, I think always, because it's like, well, you know, sex is pleasurable and mm-hmm. relationships are pleasurable, but when, when not handled with care, yeah. it becomes a really painful situation. And to that point, I just feel like for men, we, we treat sex like a stat. Mm. Um, it's, it's something that if, especially being young and coming up through high school and you got uncles and all of your, mm. all the OGs telling you, oh, I know you're getting some, right? Like it's yeah. it's that type of conversation at a very very young age for a lot yeah. of men, um, and it was all about that. It was like we're doing it for sport, mm-hmm. um, and then you don't realize that there's another person attached to that right. thing that you're entering. <laughs> yeah, without being vulgar, but yeah, like no, it's, absolutely, it's yeah. it's a human attached to that, right? And so, I just think that we we have to do a better job of protecting those hearts. Mm-hmm. Um, well, especially in today's day and age where the conversation is so tumultuous that, you know, 
if we weren't in a setting um, between two dudes who trust each other, Mm -hmm. you know, who knows what the conversation would devolve into because a lot of people are hurt and a lot of people have ideologies around Mm -hmm. this stuff. But the, the, the reality is plain and simple of like, you know, when you get dudes together to talk about this, they're willing to be reasonable. Yeah. And, and that's gotta be part of the conversation too, so that good men can be heard so that women and other men or whatever the case can Mm -hmm. be protected, you know, from being hurt. Exactly. It's the truth. I mean, we we just have to do better <laughs> as yeah. a whole. I yeah. think society has kind of put us in a position where it's like, okay, you have to be doing X, Y, Z. And I think it's even a different experience for black men as well, mm. um, just because of the fact that like a lot of the faces that we see on TV, a lot of the people that we look up to in our culture, the it's money, cars, clothes, mm. and women. That's yeah. That's what we see. Yeah. The majority of the time, our images we're so much more than that. But the images that we see on screen are usually that. Yeah. And so, for us, it automatically creates a different dynamic in regards to women. Mm. It creates a different dynamic in regards to how we handle sex, how we handle yeah. money, how we handle a lot of different things in our culture. And so. I mean, that's a, getting into a whole different yeah, conversation. But, but. I, I think it's really important, too. And, and we had kind of touched on this a little bit. And I think a, a good bridge in, in that conversation is like um, when you were stating the other the other show about the strong family unit that mm-hmm. you come from. Yeah. It's like in those realms with such expectation placed mm-hmm. on young black men. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the antidote, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Right. Strong family ties. It is. I yeah. think, so I'm very blessed, mm-hmm. and I recognize that. Yeah. There's a lot of, I have a lot of friends, a lot of people that were close to me that didn't grow up with both parents. Mm-hmm. Actually, matter of fact, the majority of my friends that were in my circle did not grow up with both of their parents in the household. Mm-hmm. So I think about that, and I'm like, I consider myself extremely, extremely blessed mm-hmm. because that's not the norm. Like, right. you have to, if... If I do a history lesson a little bit, like yeah. a lot of the welfare money was allocated based upon a father not being in the home. Yeah. So because we we were in pl- positions of struggle, mm-hmm. like we have mothers who decided, okay, no, I'm not having a father in this home. Mm-hmm. I need that check. Yeah. So they're sacrificing the relationship of the father for a check. Mm-hmm. And so you see kind of what that turns into. The family unit is completely disrupted. Yeah. And so... I mean, not to get too deep. But no, no. I, I, depth is the name of the game, right? It's like we've <laughs> got to be able to have these conversations. Yeah. And I agree with you in the sense of like in any system, when you're incentivized mm-hmm. to do something that, you know, in, on the surface isn't mm-hmm. going to look destructive, but yeah. then causes destruction, mm-hmm. it's a lot harder to pull those teeth back yeah. than it is to just do what's right up front. Exactly. And our government did not do what was right up front. No. They I mean, screwed a lot of people. On so many levels, yeah. so many levels. Yeah. I mean, the prison system, don't even get me started yeah. on the crack epidemic and all of the different layers to that yeah. that affected black people in kind of where we are today. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, again, going back to the images, like we have to do a better job of putting images that aren't so, because a lot of people think that black people are monolithic. Mm. And it's all based upon the images that we've seen on a regular basis in the entertainment industry, what's put in front of our faces. Um, we don't see a lot of positive examples of a family unit. Yeah. I remember um, there was a show on MTV back in the day, uh, VH1, called Run's House. Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. Rev yeah. Run and his kids, and that was a, a beautiful show, and it lasted for a while. Yeah. Um, but I remember when they got canceled, mm-hmm. I just always found it interesting how they replaced it with Love and hip hop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was. It's just that those type of dynamics to me, like flavor of love, was way more popular than Ryan's house. Like mm-hmm. all, the images. It's all about images to me. Like yeah. the family unit, the Cosby, the Cosby Show, going into all of those different other shows that we've seen. That wasn't the norm. Right. <laughs> so it was a big deal. It was yeah. a huge deal to see an actual father and mother in the home mm-hmm. raising their kids. Yeah. It's not normal. Yeah. And it, so. it, you know, and it needs to be. Yeah, you know, not not just in media, but mm-hmm. just 
like every piece that you're talking about just in in our society for every culture no matter what that that is a major predictor of success it is you know wh- however we would want to deem that success but if we just put it in the light of what you and I are talking about men who come from those like stable calm environments are much more likely to recreate that in mm-hmm. a family environment yeah right it's just statistics mm-hmm. we know certainly that the the larger percentages of statistics are are of like domestic violence and mm-hmm. single parent homes are a product of exactly that yeah you know? exactly i mean it's so many pieces that took parents out of their homes yeah <laughs> like it's so many like I, again going back to the crack epidemic yeah that literally took like it took black fathers, some mothers, out of their homes and locked in the cell. Mm-hmm. Now you got a kid being raised by a grandparent or a single parent. Yeah, that really there's no structure around that, and so now the cycle continues. Yeah, well, you know, and then look at states where where marijuana was legalized recently in mm-hmm. ways where like people who had gone to prison for it are mm-hmm. still locked up, even yeah. though the amount they were locked up. It's just like. You know, I have this segment. Sometimes I'll talk about like the war on drugs Mm -hmm. and we have annually it's like thirty five billion dollars that gets funded by the federal government to Mm -hmm. address substance use. Mm -hmm. And none of these problems get resolved. So it begs the question, number one, where where is that money going? Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is it going towards systems that are completely broken prison systems that do not you know, represent the justice in the way that I think probably a free society would want it to. Right. And also it's like, when you look at like the cleaner side of it, of like treatment, Mm -hmm. the biggest problem we have in treatment centers, we call it recidivism. It's Mm -hmm. people coming in and out and in and out and in and out. You know, it's just, it's not working the way, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, we could probably build a lot of expectations over like, man, this, this needs to change. But the reality is, is we can't, you know, it's like, we have no control. No. And, it's, it's something to me, like a lot of these things that we're talking about right now, it's something to me that you can't even vote your way out of. Yeah. This is structural and kind of ingrained in the fabric. Yeah. Um, and to try to undo that at this point, mm-hmm. it's going to be years and years of work to really undo that. And it has to be diligent people mm-hmm. to do that. Like it's yeah. there's certain people that really have the ideology that everything is perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's people that really believe that everything in America is perfect, is yeah. ideal. This is the greatest country on the planet. When there's a lot of holes, mm-hmm. there's a lot of it's a lot of freedom here, yes. Mm-hmm. But it's a lot of it's a mixture of a bunch of different trauma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether yeah. it's financial trauma, whether it's personal trauma, whether it's family trauma, it's a bundle of trauma. Mm-hmm. And and I stand on the line too of agreement in that regards, mm-hmm. just like we're we're on a very delicate line i yeah. think in in western culture these mm-hmm. days especially because we have this freedom yeah you know to to talk about these things it's like mm-hmm. we the pendulum i think will always course correct mm-hmm. in a way where you know things will be somewhat manageable mm-hmm. right but uh pull like we were saying before pulling those teeth back so that everybody's on an equal playing field it's like some of that damage has gone way 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 too far yeah Yeah. it's it would take years it's it's irreparable damage like to be totally honest like like i said it's in the dna of the country like it started with stealing of land Uh (laughs) of people who are already here like you literally building on the backs of, you have slaves building this country. Mm. Like it's ingrained in the fabric of the country. And so to be honest, like you have to either, it's, they don't even, it's almost like they don't even want to acknowledge the real history. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting too, because I've met a fair share of white people in my life. (laughs) (laughs) And so you get, you, you know, you get a version of that, Um, you also get a version of like white saviors, Mm -hmm. you know, I try to stand in the place of like, um, man, it's not my job to save you. I know what you're capable of as a human being, you know? Um, and it's also not my job to sit here and talk to you about the, the nature or history of it. Mm -hmm. It's my job at that time to listen, 
you know, and, and that's the balance. I saw this thing the other day. You ever see those uncut videos on Instagram where like they mm. give the questions and people come out of the shadow yeah. to sit in the lights? Yeah. <laughs> and there was this one where it was this conversation, mm-hmm. you know, to a degree they were, you know, having some other conversations. But a lot of times it's like that. It's that dangerous white dude who sits mm-hmm. on the college campus who's who. He's got the fucking band T-shirts on, mm-hmm. you know, looks like he hasn't showered, but he's kind of yeah. like waiting in the in the bushes to yeah. like console the girl. Mm-hmm. You know, he's that guy. Yeah. Right. And then he turns <laughs> into the white savior, yeah. you know, on these these kind of like ideological points mm-hmm. where now he's explaining to the African-American yeah. men and women in that group mm-hmm. what they've been through and why these, you know, are and like why, why welfare is not bad. And yeah, it's like, yeah. bro, shut up. Yeah. Like, and, and one of them had the audacity to literally say like, you know, I know I'm a white savior, but I, I really feel like I have to save people. I'm just going to do it. And, and that's the problem. If we come mm-hmm. back to like, even the concept we started talking about tonight of expectations, mm-hmm. that's the problem is people think they have that control and yeah. they don't, they no. just don't. That's our, that's been the whole problem since the beginning is people yeah. trying to control each other. Exactly. And I, I can, think I could get way too passionate. Oh, about I'm this. right there with you yeah. because that's a, that's the thing for me. Like yeah. I, I went to school in the suburbs, right? Mm. So I experienced a lot of that, a lot of those different dynamics. Um, I experienced the white kid that said, I don't see color. Mm. If you don't see color, you don't see me. Yeah. You don't understand my experience. You you can't, there's nothing that we can really converse about. Like, I, Granted, I do recognize that you're not trying to be inherently racist in any way, yeah. but just by you ign- trying to ignore it, and say that we're all the same, we're not the same. Mm -hmm. We all come with different experiences, we come with different backgrounds, we come with different day-to-day lives. So for you to say that you don't see color, that's problematic for me too. Yeah, Um, yeah. And it's just, I've dealt, I went to school during the Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown era, that was the whole time. So I'm hearing all of these different conversations and I'm having to just like, just let them have it. Yeah. (laughs) because it's not worth the debate at times. And so, um, again, I've had a lot of experiences with those dynamics and I just feel like, I just wish people would just listen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's really, you know what's funny is, is as I was hearing you share this right now, that's what I was thinking is like, you and I listen to each other when we have these conversations Mm -hmm. and Right as you were sharing, like, because I can't tell you how many times I've heard those conversations. Mm-hmm. You know, with some of my favorite that just like, man, it's. Have you ever heard the statement "Never miss a golden opportunity to shut the fuck up"? Yeah, you ever heard? Yeah, absolutely. It's like I'll think this for people sometimes when I hear shit like, "Oh, I have an ethnic friend. Mm-hmm. I'm not racist." It's like that has no that correlation. Has nothing to do with yeah. anything. Yeah, it's just like the biggest problem. I think human beings have, but especially when it comes to, you know, being in a melting pot together yeah. is that people don't listen. Yeah. You know, and they, the very they, people that say things like that don't know the definition of racism. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like they literally don't know. Like yeah. definition of racism has to do with systematic oppression. It's mm. not just a prejudice. It's not just the way that I feel about a certain group of people. Mm. It has nothing to do with that. It's structural. Yeah. So inherently the country as a whole was founded on racist ideology. Mm. <laughs> it's the bottom line. And so that's what people miss. Yeah. What I think there's a lot of truth in that. And and also you've acknowledged this too. And I'd be curious your perspective as well. Because I, I think this, this whole conversation is really good in the sense of mm-hmm. like letting go of control. Yeah. It's like, what what do we do with a system where it's simultaneously had some really fucked up roots Mm -hmm. and maybe capitalistically one of the best societies that's ever existed in that way. What, what, how do we, how do we navigate that? It's, it's such an interesting thing because I feel that the people that benefit from the, the capitalistic ways of America aren't us. (laughs) Yeah. True. It's not us. Yeah. Like, we still operate with the same stuff we've been operating since we came over here mm. from Africa. Like, it's, mm. it's really, I mean, granted, we're free, now, we're not slaves no more, obviously, right. but I'm just saying, in the sense of financial ability to really affect change or do anything, like, we don't have the ability to truthfully do that. Mm. Um, 
And so we can do it on some levels. Like we can build schools here independently. We have rich people in our culture that really have made some differences and tried to make a difference. But on a level that the government plays on, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not a lot of us that can really affect anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cer- yeah. Certainly. I think the best guys like you and I can do is have these conversations. Yeah, exactly. And just keep the conversation going. It's, I think people are afraid of these conversations because they don't, they're not used to it being peaceful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like there's, People, I'm I'm one of those people too. Like I recognize that so many people have difference of opinion. Mm. Um, there's people that's gonna hear this and be like, I don't agree with that. Okay, mm-hmm. fine. That's your opinion. You're well, entitled there, to that. There's people that'll listen to this on both sides yeah. of our ethnic backgrounds and be mm-hmm. like, well, they shouldn't be talking to. It. It's like the yeah. the level of insanity knows no bounds. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the important part though is yeah. us having this conversation. It's I can have this conversation with black people all day. It's easy. We all on the same side. We see the same stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so it's I like having this conversation with somebody that has that has a different viewpoint mm-hmm. that comes from a different perspective and a different experience. Yeah. Because it expands the conversation. Yeah. Well we've I, I don't know if you've noticed, right, mm-hmm. but we've already had a few moments where it's like, you know, we're explaining from the two different perspectives and it's, mm-hmm. it's not exactly aligned. Yeah. Right. But it's, we hear each other, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's the thing, like when you see the polarized parts of the conversation, mm-hmm. it's, it's not even that, um, it's not even that they're not on the same page It's that they don't, they're not viewing the, the conversation as equal, you right. know, it's like, yeah, the reason I think a big part, you mm-hmm. know, that you've already touched on is we were raised in different cultures, Yeah, you know? So it's like, of course I have a different worldview, mm-hmm. but I, I also like the point that you pointed out is like, I think people are afraid to have these conversations yeah. until they start to get around enough people, mm-hmm. which that's a huge piece of, of relationships and broadening your perspectives is mm-hmm. like, you got to get around people and realize like they're not, people aren't scary, man. Yeah. White, black, Asian, Hispanic, they're we're not scary. Yeah. At the end of the day, we live different experiences. We have different day to day lives, but we're still human. We bleed the same. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think when you get to the point of understanding that we're all human, you're more open to different perspectives. Yeah. And I find it interesting too, because um, I was reading about uh, DeSantis, Ron DeSantis in Florida mm-hmm. and his critical race theory oh, right, right. stuff that he has going on down there. Yeah, um, what, what do you think of that? I Honestly, I think it's, it's dismissive of history. Mm-hmm. Um, it's another example of a person in power being able to diminish what really took place. Mm. Um, and I think to us it's not fair because we don't get a lot of black history in school anyway. It's surface level. It's Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King. They don't even touch on Malcolm X. I learned Which about Malcolm X on my own. It's fascinating that they yeah. don't. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, very, it's very surface level understanding of black history. Yeah. We go from slavery to Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. They touch on slavery, touch on Jim Crow. No, don't go into no detail. Yeah. You go through, during that slavery Jim Crow time, you touch on Fred, Frederick Douglass. Mm-hmm. Never hear nothing about Mark, Marcus Garvey, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, cer- it's certain historical figures in black history that we don't get taught. We had to, I, I had a grandmother that literally every summer I would be in St. Louis, she used to make me learn about a new black history figure. Mm. Every like it was a weekly thing. Like I would spend once I moved to Texas, I'm originally from that area. I would go back there every year. Yeah. <laughs> and so my grandmother had me writing papers and all that. She was a teacher. Yeah. So those things I had to learn that I had parents who were very um into black culture, black history. Um and so I learned a lot of that on my own <laughs> through with the help of my family. Yeah. It wasn't in the school system. So it's already in part critical race theory and on top of the new DEI restrictions where they're not mm. acknowledging affirmative action no more. Um, it's like, again, it's revisionist history to me. Yeah. Like, you don't know why inf- affirmative action was put into place. It was mm. put into place because we weren't given an opportunity to go to a Harvard yeah. or a Yale or a mm. Princeton. We weren't given those opportunities, yeah. that, which is why we created our own HBCUs. Right. So 
again, like I just think that it's dismissive of history. Yeah. Um, and I, I find it disrespectful, to be totally honest. Well, I, I would imagine. I mean, like you were saying, too, it's like they play on a level that's not fair at the yeah. governmental level and, and higher, right, mm -hmm. when they can buy what we have access to, mm -hmm. you know. And, yeah, it's dismissive. It doesn't ever give the full picture. I, I often, you know, I, even outside of, like, the clinical mm -hmm. aspects when I work with individuals, it's like you got to educate yourself on the way that the world works, yeah. you know. Because um, I'll, I'll get a lot of people, you know, in, in the professional circles that believe in, like, socialism communism those kind mm -hmm. of things and, and look I'm, I'm not an ideologue i'm not going to get into like what i ideologies are better or worse yeah. um but we got to educate ourselves on you know the masses of human beings that have died yeah. under these regimes you yeah. know and and our country is not exempt no like and you've highlighted a lot of reasons as to why mm -hmm. yeah. and i i mean like you said our country is not exempt mm -hmm. and i think with examples like germany right Mm -hmm. there's Jewish people that still live in Germany today. They've acknowledged the history. Yeah. They've made reparations in certain aspects to mm -hmm. really just acknowledge what took place during the Holocaust. Yeah. We, we, for 400 years, mm -hmm. <laughs> 400 years from the time this country was founded, we were here, we built everything in D.C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's, it's so many different layers to it that aren't being acknowledged. Um, and I think for the kids who don't have that experience, understanding why there's a lot of issues amongst us, <laughs> the reason why there's a disconnect, why racism even exists in the first place in this country, yeah. um, is something that we don't acknowledge. Yeah. It's, it's something that's buried. They're trying to bury it even further. Yeah, I used to work with a lot of uh, Native American clients and, um, yeah. you know, I may look like just pure gringo, but my mm -hmm. father's side, uh, one generation back is full blood. And yeah. um, when I would work with the Native American clients, we talk a lot about blood money, you mm -hmm. know, because they get paid off. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and it, it seems like it, if you looked at it on the surface in society, it's like, oh, that's great. They're getting money. Right. Mm -hmm. And they have the casinos. It's like they're being paid off for genocide yeah. in a way that no one educates, no one acknowledges. It, the, the levels of shame mm -hmm. and substance use and self-destructive behaviors that happens yeah. in that culture because no one, it's exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You have stated it precisely. It's like the layers and layers and layers of emotional trauma, mm -hmm. all right? And it's generational. Yeah, and, and that's the problem with the conversation at a societal level is like, mm -hmm. oh, well, why can't we just get past this? It's like, <laughs> that's not the solution either. No. You know, it, that's never the solution. First never of all, gonna pain get is past the solution. Separating mothers from their kids. Yeah. You're never going to get past literally beating somebody in front of other people that look like them. Yeah. You're never going to get past having to march for the right to vote. You're never gonna get past all of these different things. Like it's, it goes. I'm going way back, but you don't have to go that far back. No, yeah. you don't have to go that far back. Yeah. So, I think until that history is acknowledged and people really get a grasp of what was really going on back then, mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't want to get into the reparations conversation because I don't. I don't know how we, I yeah. feel about that. Yeah, I mean, we probably need more time anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, it's it's a difficult thing um, because I don't know how that would even happen today. But yeah. <laughs> I will just say that acknowledgement is the first step. Mm. Um, just having a real understanding of why we are the way that we are, mm. why we come with a chip on our shoulder sometimes, Yeah, like why we – like I even use the example of Jay-Z at the Grammys, like mm. why we have to say things like that on stage. Mm. Because even to this day, there's things that we do that we produce that is not acknowledged. Mm. Yeah. And, or it's overshadowed by somebody else who, it shouldn't be overshadowed by, I'll put right. it like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I guess maybe that's, on our level, mm -hmm. 
maybe that is one way that um god how to say this it's like you know how we don't have enough power to affect the change mm-hmm. but at this level we get we we get the acknowledgement to some degree to the work mm-hmm. we put in yeah. you know and to the level maybe that it could probably not mm-hmm. you know but i think middle class level is is the best our society's ever done at that yeah. you know and you know to your point um tupac has a famous quote mm-hmm. that I, I quote often it says i may not be able to change the world but i can affect the mind who can yeah and so you never know what your voice can do mm-hmm. who your voice can impact what the next generation of what you sparked could produce yeah um it's gonna be a generational change if you're gonna make a change at all. Change is not an overnight thing. Yeah. Change is slow. It always has been, <laughs> it always will be. That's in any capacity. And so I think when we talk about making a difference, do it with your voice. Yeah. Do it with some action on whatever level you're on. Like whatever that action may look like, whether it's just giving back, whether it's I mean, I don't know, holding an event, maybe a drive or something. Who knows? Whatever that may look like for you, um, do it. Yeah. You never know who that could impact. Right. Yeah. And, and you touched on it, too, in a lot of ways of, like, you know, creating things. Yeah. You know, use your voice to get out there and mm-hmm. in a system that isn't, you know, going to acknowledge what has gone wrong. Yeah. Do it your way. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Couldn't and have and, and have these conversations. Mm-hmm. You know? Don't be afraid to talk. Yeah. People fear. I mean, in general, yeah. <laughs> communication is somewhat of a lost art. Um, and I feel like it's difficult for people to open up and have conversations about anything now. Yeah. Face to face. Yeah. Um, people are real comfortable behind the screen these days. Mm-hmm. And to me, you got to get out of Put the phone down sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> And just have a real conversation. Yeah. You know, and and I think a side note thing as well, because it isn't, I don't think it's any coincidence that this is the direction the conversation with on a topic like expectations. Mm -hmm. And the point you just made, it's like, just just communicate because you don't have to have the expectation of of on yourself to know everything, right? Because if you're going to have a conversation with someone they have a lot of information, just like, you know, you guys have seen us go back and forth tonight. Mm-hmm. Gabe had a lot of information that he grew up with that mm-hmm. I did not. Yeah. And if I don't have these conversations, right, n- not my first time having these conversations, I know it won't be the last. Mm-hmm. It, it, it won't matter how many times I have these conversations because I didn't have your lived experience. Yeah. And so it's okay to take the expectation out and listen, mm-hmm. right? Because when you have the conversation, they're going to give you the information from their experience yeah. and no matter what type of conversation it is that's why whether mm-hmm. it's relationships having a conversation about racial disparities throughout generations mm-hmm. whether it's a conversation about religion spirituality health or wellness mm-hmm. let the expectations go and just connect with the person in front of you yeah. and i think on our level outside mm-hmm. of any of the shit we don't have control over mm-hmm. that's how guys like you and i can make change at least in the dallas fort worth area yeah. yeah and i think the solution is on the bridge of multiple different perspectives yeah so somewhere in the middle of all of these different perspectives and ideologies and viewpoints is the truth yeah. <laughs> Yeah. is the necessary thing that's going to take us to the level that we need to be at. Yeah. And so without having the conversation, you'll never get there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we, I think even us as black people, we do have a sensitivity to things that are a part of our history. Mm-hmm. Um, and so hearing somebody dismiss it is a trigger for us. Yeah. Um, and so we become reactive and emotional in a lot of situations mm-hmm. when in actuality, you, a lot of times we need to talk to the people that don't have the same perspective mm-hmm. so we can understand why they feel the way that they feel. Yeah. Um, and it's black people that don't even have the same perspective. So it's mm-hmm. it's a lot of different dynamics there, but I feel like it all starts with conversation and when it comes to finding a solution or finding a change. Yeah, so. yeah. and I, I knew this starting it, but 
I would imagine a place where a guaranteed common ground guys like you and I will find is when you're looking for a solution, right? And if you're not a religious person, you can cover yours on this one. But if you're looking for a solution, a common ground in the middle of that bridge is God. Yeah. You know, and that's the only real solution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, when we give it up to something bigger than us, I, I think one thing I've noticed as well of any research I've done in, in, cultural genocides and difficulties in society Mm -hmm. is it's when people depart from God, Mm -hmm. they start killing each other, man. They start trying to gain power over others and that Mm -hmm. will never work. It'll never work. It won't. It's not even nothing without God. It's going to operate smoothly. Yeah. Again, I said it last week, but the peace of God is in how he says yes. Mm -hmm. And so yes, in all capacities, like whatever that situation may be, it could be a relationship. It could be in situations like this, like what we've been discussing tonight, like his, the peace that we find can only be in his yes. Right. In his. Okay. Yeah. Cause if he said it, what, what I'm gonna argue for? Yeah. <laughs> like what we yeah. talk about? Yeah. Who am I you know? to yeah. question this? Exactly. Yeah. So I have to roll with his plan, mm-hmm. even if his plan is not mine. Right. Yeah. That's it. And that'll help you with expectations for sure. Absolutely. All right. So if this could be a testament to uh, to those listening tonight, you know, Gabe and I didn't plan this out. You know, we just uh, at this Please point, not. we've been working together. We trust each other. So we had an open conversation. Let yeah. that be a testament to, you know, when you when you put expectations of what things need to be aside mm-hmm. and you just have good, honest conversation with people, you're going to find common ground. And even if you can't or you just don't agree, mm-hmm. still have the conversation. Absolutely. I'm mm-hmm. in agreement. man. Yeah. Cool. All righty, guys. Well, that's all we got for you tonight. We love you. We'll see you in the next one. Take care. Right.